Hi, I'm Ronnie Raja, and I'm a sophomore at the Miami Valley School. And I'm going to be talking about some of my takeaways from our cl from class so far. So one of the first things that we discussed in class was an excerpt um, from Fromm's To Have or To Be. And while all of the sections in that excerpt were very interesting, one that stuck out to me was the learning section because I think that it applies to us as students. This section discussed the difference between learning in the having mode and learning in the being mode. It said that students who are learning in the having mode just show up to class and memorize what's said in the lecture so they can take a test but they don't actually engage with the material. I have definitely both seen and done this before, and while I try not to, I think that especially in science and math courses, where there's lots of formulas and things like that that you have to memorize, it can be very easy to slip into the having mode. However, Fromm says that it's better to be in the being mode, and he says that students in the being mode, quote, do not go to the course lectures, even to the first one in a course as tabula rasa. I didn't know what this meant, so I looked it up, and tabula rasa describes the mind in its blank or empty state before receiving outside perceptions. What Fromm is saying is that the that in the being mode, students have already thought about the topics before they hear the lecture, and they know their opinion on the subject. Then, when they hear the lecture, they're actively engaged and they take the new information they receive to deepen their understanding of the topic and consider new ideas. I think that this mode is a much more beneficial way to learn, but I feel that in many schools, it's easier to succeed in the having mode, since many tests are built to simply measure whether or not a student was paying attention and remembers the information, rather than if they truly understand it, Many students learn early on to go into the having mode in a school setting. However, I don't think that's the best way to approach learning, and that's one of the reasons that I come to a school like this, where you can be in the being mode more often. So Fromm also says that this mode of learning can, quote, this mode of learning can prevail only if the lecture offers stimulating material. In such circumstances, students in the being mode find it best not to listen at all, but to concentrate on their own thought process. This stood out to me because it's very against the traditional view, um, which would say that you need to pay attention and be active whether the information you're receiving is interesting or not, and that, in fact, the worst thing that you could do would be to lose focus and pay more attention to your own thoughts and to the lesson. So that's what I've been taught to do my whole life, but is this a better way to learn? Personally, I don't think so. Um, I think it depends on the situation, but for the most part, I think it can still be valuable to listen to something that you do not feel interesting because whoever's teaching that obviously finds the subject to be engaging, which means that it's possible that there's something within that subject that you will also be interested in, but if you just don't listen and instead only think about the things that you have encountered before that have engaged you, you might miss out on this new interesting topic which could lead you to new discoveries and growth. Fromm also reflects on loving in the having and being mode. According to Fromm, loving in the being mode implies caring, knowing, affirming, responding, and enjoying. But loving in the having mode implies stifling and suffocation. He also says that you lose love when you get complacent, when it's a thing that you have and no longer a thing that you fight for. He uses the example of marriage and says that when a couple first starts dating, they try to impress each other. They know that they need to put in effort and care for the other person if they want that person to stay with them. However, when people get married, there is a label on the other person and they have that person. They stop trying to care for the other person like they did before, and their love fades. I'm not sure if I agree with this. I've never been married, but I think that this could apply to friendship. So I have a friend named Catherine who I met when I was in first grade. When we first became friends, we would share our lunches, write each other notes, make each other jewelry, or anything to remind the other person that we cared, similar to how couples care for each other when they're dating. We decided that we were best friends and we took on that label. Then I moved all the way across the country to California for three years and since I didn't have a phone we only wrote letters back and forth every few months. When I came back to Ohio we went to different schools and we only see each other once a month or so. 
we no longer give each other gifts or share our lunches like we did before we decided we were best friends, but our connection is still there. And we still both know that we will always have each other's back and we still consider ourselves best friends, even though we no longer spend every day together. Though our actions are in the having mode, we still have the connection that Fromm describes in the being mode. I think that if two people have a strong connection, even if they no longer strive to impress the other person, they can still keep their love and not lose it. Now, obviously this doesn't apply to everyone and every relationship, and I agree that many marriages and friendships have ended over a loss of love and connection, but there are cases where I think Fromm's theory is not applicable. The next thing we discussed in class was Joseph Campbell's model of the psyche, which I had never seen before. One thing that I found interesting was how much bigger the unconscious awareness was than the conscious awareness. As humans, we tend to like to think that we are very self-aware and that there is little that gets past us, but according to this model, it is just the opposite. I think that this is true because we see and register so much throughout our lives even if we do not consciously recognize it. It also seemed fitting that our psyche was represented by a circle, which implies it is more easily moldable, whereas our ego was represented by a square, which is much more rigid and not as easily altered. I'm looking forward to learning more about both expanding our ego as well as how, how and why one would go about doing this. Finally, I really like the atmosphere of our class. It does have a lot of people, but I don't think that this has negatively affected my learning at all. Everyone in the room really wants to be there, which gives the class a genuine feel. And the fact that some people come in during their freeze to listen lends some importance to both the class and the material. I mean, people have been engaged in considering what other people have to say, and I love how we can challenge each other and that we don't have to accept everything we hear, but we can do so in a respectful way. I've already learned and considered so many things in this class, and we've only had a few classes, so I'm excited for the rest of the year.